You have to convince yourself out of the comfort zone. Because you start thinking about legacy and you start thinking about, um, have I done enough? And am, am I planning enough to leave to my kids? And I don't know. Well, hey, John, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me today. I think it's going to be I fun. I am so excited to have you here. So um, you were actually on my podcast back in 2017. Do you remember that? that was darker like, hair, yeah. darker hair. My you had hair darker hair? Dark. Oh my gosh, yeah. I had a like smaller midnight. waist. It was like midnight back then. Yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, but that was like, I looked it up. It was episode 40. So it's been a hot minute ago because we're on, I mean, I'm, I'm on 350 something. That's I think. amazing. Nobody I makes it that far. That's right? a real deal. It's That's been awesome. five years. Well, it's really good seed planting for my audience. And, you know, it's a really good segue into my programs and things. So, sure. but I had a bone to pick with you right at the top of the podcast yeah. here, because yeah, back on that podcast, episode 40, yeah. you were throwing a little shade at the Kansas City airport. Yeah. And yeah. I'm based out of Kansas City and you travel all the time or sure. did then at least as a speaker yeah. and you were hating on the Kansas City airport. So I just wanted to let you know, we've got a brand new one. Yeah. It is fancy schmancy. Yeah. There are restaurants in it. There's places you can sit down. It's like, it's officially like 21st century. So I just want to let you know. Yeah. I love that. You know, your old airport was bad when you brag on the ability to sit down. What you guys have that now? Like you're not just doing standing airport seating too. That's amazing. Jennifer. I know it, it a, was, it was what really a revolution. Bad. What a it revolution. was really bad. So, so you've had a lot going on since you were here, you know, six years yeah, ago. Totally, so, totally. um, you are up to how many books now? Nine. Uh, this is the ninth. Yeah. This is the okay. ninth book. So when people say, Hey, John, what, what do you actually do? What do you, do you tell them I'm an author or do you tell them I'm a speaker, author, speaker? I tell them I do two things. I write books and then I go speak to companies about the books. So those okay. are kind of the two primary things I do. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm okay to mention this or not, but I just recently learned something about you. I didn't know that for a fraction of a period of time, and we can edit this out of the podcast if we're not to talk about it, but you work for Ramsey Corporation. Oh yeah. For I Ramsey. spent three years there. I learned a ton. It was like a PhD no in being an entrepreneur. Yeah. I had ton, no ton, idea. Ton. Yeah. So yeah, Dave no, Ramsey- no need to edit that at all. I learned yeah. a ton. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, Dave Ramsey has always been like top three people I would ever want to have lunch with. I've spoke at um, Business Boutique when Christy was still there. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah, I've spoken at like an off room a couple of times, got to meet Dave and his wife. They're precious. And so that was kind of cool. I, I had no idea about, yeah, about that. Totally. That's what moved me to Nashville. He was, he oh. um, and his team were like, hey, we want to show you how to do this on a bigger level. And so I just got, I mean, I had somebody once tell me it fast forwarded my career by 10 years. So yeah, I have I love that. nothing but great things to great say things about to what say. I learned there. Gosh, it yeah. was, it, again, it was like a PhD. Yeah. Well, a lot of my listeners know my story, but in 2008, 2009, when Dave still had a radio show, and I don't know if you can still call into his radio show or not. Oh yeah, but, totally. I think um, I owned a painting company that was based highly upon how well the um, housing market was doing. So I was doing a lot of new construction things. And my husband was a realtor. And I don't know if you remember 2008, yeah, 2009, awesome. but it was kind of a dumpster fire for the real yeah. estate market. And so, yeah. you know, we were living on credit cards. It was a hard time for us. And so I remember calling that 1-800 number for Dave and, you know, they screened me or whatever, and then called back. And I was actually live with him on the show and I'm boohooing because I'm like, do we need to turn in our 401ks? Do we need to declare bankruptcy? Yeah. He was so kind. He was like, every father that you would ever want. He said oh, all the right great. fatherly things. And all I could do is cry the whole time. And so even when I met him then at Business Boutique in Nashville, I cried when I met him in that. And so anyway, uh, I love that. Yeah, so good. love him. I didn't know we had that in common. That's awesome. I didn't either. I didn't either. I want to talk about your new book though. All it takes is a goal. I actually have one sitting right here. So tell us about your new book. What was, what was the catalyst for writing that? And um, give us an idea of what it's about. Yeah. So whenever I write a book, I look for three things. Um, one is I look for a personal connection. How am I personally connected to the content? If you're going to talk about an idea for mm -hmm. years and years and years and years, you should have a heart connection. The yeah. second thing I look for is a need. Do other people need this? Am I hearing about it online? Am I hearing about it from neighbors? Do I see, to, do I see a need? And the third thing is I look for a spot in the marketplace. Can I fit somewhere with this message? So the need um, was there. We, we did up. um, a survey with 3000 people. I have a, a yeah. professor named Mike Peasley who helps me. And we asked 3000 people if they feel like they're living up to their full potential. And 96% of people said no. So I had this idea that, okay, there's a lot of us that don't feel like we're living up to our full potential. And then the personal connection was when I toured the college I went to, 
um, with my oldest daughter, cause she was mm-hmm. going to potentially go there. My wife said, wasn't college amazing. And I was having the opposite experience. I had, I was a nightmare in college. I wasted those years and I felt this great sense of what if this great sense yeah. of regret. And so I had a personal connection to go, how, how can I live going forward? I can't change college, but that was four yeah. years. If I have 40 sure. years ahead of me, what can I do? And then I went into the marketplace and a lot of books that talk about potential, talk about it in a very fuzzy, very, the universe will help you like, no, it won't. The universe is busy, like jamming ships into the Suez canal. Like it has very little concern for my potential. So I realized, I think I can write a really funny, really tactical book about potential. I think a lot of people need it. And I know I'm connected to it on a heart level. So that's what inspired me to spend a few years writing this book. Okay. I love that. I also love that we have kids at a similar age because you have kids that are college age now. Am I right? Yep, and yep. Um, can I ask how old you are? Yeah, I'm 47. Yeah. Totally okay. Old. So I read that you had said that you don't feel like you lived up to your full potential till you were 45. And I'm like, I don't even know that I knew he was 45 yet. So that's why I wanted yeah. to ask your age. So totally. what did you mean by that, that you didn't live up well, to your So own? I started kind of getting my act together in my mid thirties. Like College was a mess. I was, you know, just had a chip on my shoulder. Now I can look back on it and go, I was insecure and it came off as arrogance. Like that was the shield, the particular shield. Um, Got into raving my senior year, like dancing in warehouses at 4 a.m. with shiny clothing. So just a mess. Mid 20s weren't much better. I get married, we have a couple of kids and I kind of hit a career ceiling where there was nowhere else for me to go. I climbed to the top of a, my p- particular career. Yep. I was a senior content designer, which is fancy for copywriter. And there was no super duper senior content designer. So I hit this wall and I started to really believe in the power of goals. I started to try mm-hmm. some goals. I started a blog. I started to get up earlier. I started yes. to test all these goals in my life. And so what I mean by like 45 ish was that's when I toured the college and said, okay, what was it look like for me to go to the next level? Like, I think there's more to give, there's more Mm -hmm. to do. So that's when I really started to say, okay, I can't change yesterday, but I can change tomorrow by doing something different today. So what does that look like? And so that's what I mean, where I didn't, I call myself a late bloomer. I think there's some people, they came out of the womb and they are an entrepreneur or they were like, they, they were a podiatrist when they were eight and like, I got to be in defeat. Like they knew I was the opposite of that. It took me years and years and years and years, um, to kind of figure out and dial it in. And so about 10 years ago, started my own business. And I feel like every year, like I say it now, like I like my forties more than I did my thirties. And I liked my Mm -hmm. thirties more than my twenties. And I think I'm going to love my fifties. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that, John. Oh, a hundred percent. No, I, I, cause I am 51. And my girlfriends and I were just having this conversation this week. And so I'll let my, uh, the listeners yeah, like, let's go. I'm on Instagram. If they, um, if they want to speak into this, but I loved my forties also, I yeah. loved the forties. Yeah. I, I loved my thirties. Yeah. Um, I think that I was a late bloomer also. So I, you know, there's some people that peak in high school. I tended to peak, you know, mid thirties, um, yeah. into my forties, yeah. but now at 51, almost 52, um, I'm not loving the fifties so much. What don't you love about it? Uh, something happens when you hit 50 there, there's a, there's a mind shift thing. It could be a female thing. Um, but it's almost like you realize, oh shoot, now I'm on the back nine. Like if you're a golfer, you know what that means? You know, like, you're like, now I'm on the downhill slide. And so then you start really thinking about more about like legacy, like up to 50. I think we were thinking about like, you know, the rocking and rolling and jamming and making sure we could have, you know, the nice house and the things and take the kids on vacation. Well, now we're on the downhill side, meaning we've got, you know, kids that are, I know your kids age. So we've got um, 21, 19, you know, they're out of the house. So, so there's this, like, I wonder if we did everything we could, you know, and we're, we're watching them, you know, from like, almost like up above and, you know, we've still got two little ones also. And by the way, we're really old for that. I just had yeah. lunch with my eight-year-old today. So we've got, you know, 21 to eight, but yeah, it's, a big it's range. interesting because you start thinking about legacy and you start thinking about, um, have I done enough? And am, am I planning enough to leave to my kids? And I don't know. I'm just, I am not loving my fifties yet. Mm-hmm. And I have three girlfriends who are also in their fifties and all three of them agree. But see, for me, I think in seasons like that, you just need a new scorecard. So often what happens is people enter a new season and they don't give themselves a new scorecard. So they judge the season they're in 
by the old scorecard. So they go, here's how I felt in my forties. I don't feel that way now. Well, you're not going to, because you're in a different season altogether. Yes. So you need to pause and go, okay, what are the new goals for this season? What are the new so moments for this season? Like, and I see a micro version of that is, and let's, let's talk to moms for a second. I meet moms that'll come up to me and say, John, I'm failing to pursue my goal. I'm just, I'm, mm-hmm. I used to be so much better at goal setting. I'll go, well, tell me about your life. And they'll say, well, I have a four-year-old and two twin two-year-olds. And I don't know why I'm having a hard time doing my goal. I'll say, <laughs> You're raising humans. Yes. You're raising humans. Like you need to give yourself some grace or yeah. on the flip side, I'll meet people that'll say, I'm not doing my, I'm not building my real estate business fast enough. And I'll go, well, has anything changed recently? And they go, no, not really. And then they'll say, well, I mean, I am taking care of my dad who has dementia. So yeah. that's something new. And I'll go, you got to adjust to that. So yeah. every year I look at it as, okay, it's a new year. It's a new season. I need a new scorecard. Um, and my thing is I was late to my thirties. I'm going to be early to my sixties. Like I didn't have a plan for my thirties and it was a mess, but you better believe I'm going to enter my sixties with like a plan and some goals and some like, I'm not waiting for that decade to be dope. I'm going to go ahead and work on it now. So that's how I kind of look at it. Now I'm 47. So I haven't hit 50 technically yet. But I can, I can already see like, okay, three years from now, what do I want that to look like? Four years from now, what am yes. I thinking about? I don't control that. I don't spend a ton of time going, it has to be exactly this. Yeah. But if I can dream into it and give myself permission to kind of have a new scorecard, I don't judge it based on the old way I lived because then it's just a mess. Yeah, I love that. That gives me something to ponder. Um, I wanted to ask you when you were talking about your full potential, um, my husband and I were having a conversation with our freshman in high school this week. Um, and uh, she did really great on some finals this week. And we were like, girl, good job. Um, and she said, uh, cause she doesn't always love school. Can I just go ahead and say that I've got, we've got a couple of kids that love school and I've got a couple that do not. So she's not always a lover of studying and things. And so she said, um, I do pretty good when I apply myself. So is potential the same as applying yourself? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I think it can be, here's how I would look at it. So I kind of define potential as the difference between your vision and your reality. So here's how you hope life could be. Here's Mm -hmm. the reality. And there's this big gap between it. And so with something like that, I'd say, okay, it's kind of like going, you know, a Ferrari is fast when you know how to drive it. Like it's still a Ferrari when you're not driving it quickly, but it's not being put to its purpose. Mm -hmm. So when she says, I have a ton of skills when I apply them, but I don't always apply them. I go, oh, that's the equivalent. I put this in the book of only opening half of your presents every Christmas. Like that's the thing that got me is 50% of the people in the study said only 50% of them is being used. They're only applying 50% of themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you walk down every Christmas morning and there was a huge pile of presents, you only opened half and people were saying, you can open the rest, that would be strange. But so for something like that, I'd go, yeah. I would, in in a conversation like that, I'd say, well, What's consistent about when you do apply yourself? What are the conditions? Because let's repeat those conditions. So if she goes, when my back's against the wall and I got a deadline and yes. I like the professor and I care about the subject and I don't have a ton of time to overthink it, like it's time mm-hmm. box. And, and mom and dad are saying you'll be grounded if you don't get a certain yeah, grade. There's like, consequences, yeah. all the stuff. I would go, great, let's just recreate that. Like, let's not try to find some subject that you hate doing and go, you have to love this. That that doesn't make any sense. Like there's things you have to do that you yeah. might not want to do. That's part of being an adult, part of life. But I would go, okay, I know that humans feel better when they're tapping into who they really are because it's how they were designed. Amen. So if I can help them do more of that, like people who finish goals don't write hate mail. Like they're too busy finishing goals. People who have a purpose don't gossip about other people. They're too busy living their purpose. So when you can tap into that, if your life is so much better and then you get to share it with other people and inspire them. So yeah, I would say not applying to yourself is just saying you're only using some of your potential. And then my question is always, well, what, you know, what would happen if you use more of it? What would you get? See, the problem is we go, you should just do it. You should do it. No, 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 no. You should always go, what do I win if I play? What do I win? You never logic yourself out of a comfort zone. You never, like you would never say to your daughter, well, you know, long-term studies have shown that people who apply themselves in school get better <laughs> jobs and their 401ks. Right. Right, no, right. what do I win if I play? If I'm, you have to convince yourself out of the comfort zone. And it's usually with something that's better than what's on the inside. 
I love that. I love that. Tell me about the vision wall, because you talked in your book about the first roadblock that we encounter and you were talking about a vision wall. Will you tell us about that? Yeah. So this one's really funny because it's, it's basically just a misinterpretation of some brilliant ideas. Like Stephen Covey's begin with the end in mind. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yes. Um, Simon Sinek, start with why brilliant. Yeah, that book brilliant. is brilliant. Great book. But what happened is that people have now misinterpreted it to mean I can't begin until I know the end until mm. I have a perfect end. I can't start my podcast until right. I know what episode 500 is going to be like, or until I know exactly what this business is going to be like, I can't do anything. I had a friend spend six months trying to figure out his why, because he was convinced once I have the why, then it'll all make sense. Nice. It'll all, and anyone who's, who's ever built a business, lost weight, uh-huh. um, started a family, you weren't, you didn't have a perfect vision. Like you really didn't. So the vision wall is this obstacle that says, until you know exactly where you're going, you can't take the first step. Mm -hmm. And that's just not true. So you have to figure out a way around the vision wall to go, okay, what are some first steps I can take? I don't have to know the very end. I don't Mm -hmm. have to know perfectly where it's going to be because I didn't, I didn't know 10 years ago that I'd be doing this. I had no idea. If somebody told me 10 years ago, you will have written nine books. You'll, you know, like, if somebody told me 15 years ago, you've never been to Nashville, but you're going to live there. Like, you're yeah. gonna, I would say, no, of course I'm not like, of course mm-hmm. I'm not going to do this, but we put this pressure on ourselves sometimes where like an entrepreneurs do it, where they try to micro niche you. Like if you're a new entrepreneur, people tell you all the time, you got to know down. your micro niche. The right? riches are in the niches. Yes. <laughs> you got to niche down. You go, but I just, I want to be a florist. And they go, no, you got to sell flowers only in Beverly Hills, only a certain type of flowers from Malaysia, only to women named Karen. Or yeah. <laughs> only, only to women named Sheila. And you're like, that feels really niched. And really it, it's taking, yeah, it's taken me 10 years to go. No goals are what I love. I'm obsessed with goals. I'm yes. going to write a lot about goals. I've written a lot of different books that were all leading me towards goals. And now 10 years in, I can go, I've done so many laps. I know what fires me up and I know what I feel qualified yeah. to write about, but I didn't start 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Here's exactly where I'm going. And the vision yeah. wall wrecks a lot of people because they think they have to know before right. they go. Well, and I think that's, um, it's, that sounds a lot like faith too, because I think sometimes we want to know where we're headed so that we can kind of take those first steps. And I think like, it's biblical to that you take the first steps and then sometimes you get directed. Do you know oh what I mean? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So- I mean that, yeah, fine. Add the biblical element, like Abraham, go to the land. I'll show you like right. the rhyme I do. Cause I'm a pastor's kid and we rhyme and do alliteration yes. is the growing is in the going. The growing is in the going. You don't get to grow until you go. I learn how to be a parent by parenting. Nobody listening to this was like, first I got ready and I was perfectly ready to be a parent. And then I had a kid. No, you learn in the going. And so from a biblical perspective, I had a friend say, you know, God's a, a lamp unto your feet, not a lamp unto your mile. He doesn't show you the whole mile. I ask him all the time. So good. I ask him all the time for 10-year plans. I'm like, God, if you'll give me a 10-year plan, if you'll give me the 10-year map, I'll do that. He won't give me that because he knows if I had the map, I'd worship the map, not the map maker. Mm. So he gives me- I I love that. He gives me enough for the day, which by the way, his mercies are new every morning. Every day. So like, I need a daily relationship, not a, here's the next 10 years. It's hard to find in the Bible where God said, here's exactly what's going to happen for this individual's life for the next 10 years. It's a lot easier to find where he said, no, trust me. Like, come on, come trust me for today. Trust me for today. You know, I think that you and I, um, there's a lot of people have like, I'm always hearing about five-year goals, but I have always said, God's never given me a five-year goal. And I think the reason he hasn't is because in my trying to help him (laughs) in that five years, like I would completely mess it up. Yeah. Completely mess it up. So I love that we're talking about this because I think this is also, and this is not even my notes, but I feel like I should just mention this. I think that there are so many women who, cause you know, I coach all entrepreneurs who are waiting until they feel confident to start something. And I'm always like, no, 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 no. You need to ask the Lord to give you courage because in courage, you'll take that first step. And the confidence will come after you've taken several steps and you've done several things and you've realized, okay, this didn't actually kill me. Then you will possibly build some confidence as you go, but it takes courage to be Again, not the five-year plan and not confidence. Agree or disagree? A hundred percent agree. Courage comes before clarity. I always say that all the time. It's like courage comes before clarity. And so yes. for me, 
that's been my experience too. And that doesn't mean you don't dream about the five years you do. I'm right. dreaming about what would my fifties look like? Like what would be like one of my goals that is probably 10 years out is I want to be able to financially take my kids and their husbands, if they get married mm -hmm. yes. on family vacations. And I'm inspired yes. to do that because my friend, his parents are taking their entire family to Hawaii, like that's, 20 people. I yes. want to do that. So that's yeah. a 10 year, five year vision. Mm -hmm. Like, so you still dream about the future, mm -hmm. but God, right. again, didn't say, here's exactly how it's going to happen. If he told me how things would happen, it, I couldn't even begin to understand it. I right. couldn't, you know, like I couldn't contain that. So for me, I mean, I, I think when it says, you know, about peace that surpasses understanding, I think there's creativity that surpasses understanding. I think there's wisdom that surpasses understanding. I don't have to understand it to take steps into it. Like I really Love don't. That. And that's so much easier than going until I figure this out. I can't move. I love that. How do you and Jenny feel about arranged marriages? Because I've got a 21 year old named Noah. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> I, yeah. Hey, here's hey, the thing. Like, I'm like you, I think your daughter is close to my son's age. Yeah. She, uh, here's the thing about that. I always, I think I had somebody, a friend of mine, uh, his dad's a pastor and he said, uh, he said in arranged marriages, they start out cold and grow hot in American marriages. They start out hot and grow cold. Oh, and I wow. thought, oh, that's, and he was, he had served, um, he had yeah. served in India and he was talking about that. So that's so funny. Yeah. I've got a 19 year old, and a 17 year old. Those are my, okay. Favorite. I have, we have 21 and 19. So, all right. So let's talk about the rear view mirror. Cause I know, um, you talk about that in your book about an alternative approach to potential, which is looking through the rear view mirror instead of forward and ahead. So talk about that. Yeah. So there's an exercise in the book called the best moment list where you really figure out who you are. It's the, I, I kind of joke that I've never taken an honest personality test and it's fine because nobody really? says either. Yeah. Cause some element of should sneaks into every personality test. You go like when you're doing the answers, like you're I should filling it out. This. You're like, I should listen yeah. more to people. I'll put that. Or I should okay. like, yeah. or the good Christian answer would yeah, be. Yeah. Or like, I know what they want me to say here. Like I, and so what the um, best moments list talks about is, okay, what are, what's the joy that's lit you up in the past? You see, we, it's really fascinating. There was a study that for every 100 studies on sadness, there's only one on joy. Like we obsess about sadness. Wow. So when you go to, let's just take counseling, you go to counseling, you talk about your worst moments. Like mm -hmm. I went to counseling and they had me draw a trauma egg, a picture of all the bad things that happened to me from childhood to current day. When you get into a new small group at a church, mm -hmm. you tell your stories. 90% yeah. of it are the hard things we've been through. This is very rarely do you have somebody go, I want to explore your joy. I'm curious over the last 20 years, That's what's good. lit you up? Because if you learn from your past, it informs your today and helps you prepare your tomorrow. So if I know, here's the things they're not versus going, like, if you tell somebody dream about the next 20 years, that's a terrifying experience. People mm -hmm. get this blank piece of paper and they go, I mean, I guess like kids or money, yeah. it's impossible. But if you go, I want to walk through your last five years, your last mm -hmm. 10 years, your last 20 years, the things that will lit you up and let's make a list of those. And let's see if you're doing those today. And if you're not doing those today, why aren't you doing those today? And that's could we good. put more of those into tomorrow? And then you come up with this really amazing life plan. That's not based off fantasy of what could be. It's mm -hmm. based off of who you really are. It's like discovering an owner manual for yourself and going, oh, uh, that's right. Because most of the time, I guarantee you see this with the people you coach, the things they discover are reunions. It's like you're coming back to you and you go, wait a second, that's right. I didn't know that yes. was a skill. I just thought everybody could do that. And I didn't yeah. know other people couldn't do that. And I can do that. And it actually makes me feel really good when I do that. I love to create this kind of project yeah. or this business. And it's a reunion. Very rarely is it the first time it's ever happened. It's just often we don't look to our past because we're told things like, mm -hmm. don't look back. You're not going that direction as if the past has nothing to teach you. That's so good. I've never even really thought about that saying, but you're exactly right. That's so, so good. Um, I want to talk about zones. Yep. I know you talk about the chaos zone and it kind of makes me giggle because um, I have a lot of very creative women in my audience. And sure. so, you know, they're um, not necessarily all like, you know, makers or DIYers or work with their hands, but um, just a lot of really creative, chaotic brains and much like myself. And so when I read that about the chaos zone, I was like, why do I relate to that? And I don't even know exactly what that is yet. So tell us what that is. Yeah. So the book talks about there's three different zones and imagine like a line and on one different end of it, it says the comfort zone, 
which okay. is no goals, no actions, no progress. Mm -hmm. The other end of the line is the chaos zone, which is too many goals, too many actions, still no progress. And what happens, the reason they call it a yo-yo diet is you swing back and forth between these two yes. things. You're never dieting at all. You're not doing anything. You're in the comfort zone. And then you get inspired and you swing over here and go, I'm going to weigh everything I eat. I'm only going to eat green matcha powder. I'm going to get a Peloton. I'm going to do it all today. Right. And you go to the chaos zone and you run, 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 run. And it's not sustainable and right. it falls apart and you end up not really having long-term success. And in the middle of those two is the potential zone where you're doing the right actions, the right goals, mm -hmm. and you're getting some progress. So the chaos zone is where a lot of people kind of jump. They have a little bit of a win in the comfort zone and they go, if one thing is good, a hundred would be even better. And they ricochet yeah. over. And where I see, I see entrepreneurs get stuck with this is they'll often tell me the 10 things they want to do mm -hmm. and they're completely divorced from reality. So I'll go, well, how much time do you have available this week to do that? Yeah. And they go, I don't know. I'm just going to figure hours. it out. I'm just going to do it. And yeah. you go, okay, well, you have two hours free time mm -hmm. this week. You have 40 hours of things planned. You're going to try to shove those 40 hours into the two hours. It's going to be a mess. You're, you're yeah. not going to do it. So what if we figure out a sustainable way to do this? That's the chaos zone. And I, you know, a chaos zone example would be people that come up and go, I want to lose weight. I want to start a business. I want to date my spouse. I want to, you know, I want to read more. I want to meditate. I want to yeah. and they'll list 12 goals and you'll go, I think you have time for one. Right. You can add, we can build on that, but they, they get really excited. They want to do them all at once. That's chaos zone behavior. And you never build up any momentum. Um, so my feelings are semi hurt. Do you're keeping yeah. bringing the weight loss no, yeah. kidding. <laughs> because um, I shared in one of my podcasts recently that it's been kind of a rough two years at our house. Um, my husband yeah. was in a cycling accident. We've purchased two additional homes in addition to the one we have VRBOs. Um, so we, we just have a lot we're managing on top of four children. Yeah. And so, um, the first thing, a lot of times that I let go is my eating is my exercising is my health. Sure. So I've gained 30 some pounds in the last two years. So anyhow, I relate so much to what you're saying of swinging. Cause I was, I'm swinging from donuts and mashed potatoes right now to gym every single day. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, I tell people it's because I have such a like, go big, go home mentality. I'm either yeah. all in or I'm all out. How do I break away from that? Either being all in or all out. Like, how do I make myself kind of get back to the center so that I'm out of chaos and out of comfort? Yeah. Um, because this is probably by the way, the same 25, 30 pounds that I've gained, you know, and lost and gained the last three sure. or four times as an adult. So, sure. so I don't like swinging way back over and I don't want to swing way back over to mashed potatoes and donuts again, um, unless it's in moderation or, yeah. you know, but, um, so how do you, how do you get some sort of moderation in there? Well, so some of it is you listen to the stories you're telling yourself. So like when you get into chaos zone, you tell yourself mm -hmm. stories, like this is the new forever. Like this mm -hmm. is going to be forever. I'm forever going to go at this pace. I'm forever going to do this. And you go, no, this is the new normal. And you go, but it, but it might not be like, so one of the simple exercises I do is I'll cut things by 25%. So I'm a maximizer. I get into the chaos zone in a second. I'm a go, go, go guy, like a hundred percent. So an example of that would be recently, my wife said, Hey, um, you have four full-time jobs. That's what she said to me. And that was a polite way of saying you're a workaholic and right. you have an early stress related heart attack. And this is miserable. And so I, I listened to her and I kind of went through the list and I was like, oh, you're right. Like being a speaker is a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I'll speak 50 to 60 times this year. For a lot of people, that's a full-time right. job. Yeah. Um, I just signed a four book deal. I've got a lot of books to write. That's a full-time yes. job. I manage a team. That's a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I have a podcast full-time job. And so what happened for me is I did an hour exercise where I added up all the hours I had committed to project-wise. And I added up all the hours I wanted to work and I was off by 500 hours. I was off by a quarter of a year. So wow. I was stressed out because I was trying to do a five quarter year in a four quarter year. They only right. have four quarters. Right. So for me, that made it tangible. So one thing you can do is go, okay, I'm saying that I'm going to work out every day for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. No, no, you're not. There's right. going to be days yeah. you miss. Not like, a chance. That's just, there's yes. not a chance. Um, and also where are the hours going? So when you tell me like, Hey, we bought two houses, we doing all, we're doing all this thing. My first thought is like, I wonder what she stopped. Like, I wonder what she dropped because people like you and I, we don't drop, we just add. And what happened we, in COVID is that people that, especially entrepreneurs, 
when their normal stuff got put on pause because of COVID, they uh -huh. pivoted and added new stuff. And yes. now the old stuff has come back and they've got double jobs and they don't even realize it. Like That's now so they, they just folded it back in. They didn't stop the pivot stuff. Uh -huh. They just were like, welcome to the party. And there's a whole lot of people like that right now. So when I say I cut things by 25%, what I mean is I did this yesterday. I was at a hotel and I was in Dallas and I was going to speak at 3 p.m. And it was like mm -hmm. 7 a.m. And I was like, I got X amount of hours. And I made a list of like the 12 things I wanted to do. And yeah. then I have to cut it by 25% because I never estimate correctly how long someone right. takes me. And I always overfill it. And so I just cut the list by 25% and that crushes me. I don't feel good doing that. Yeah. I feel amazing after when I crush those seven things versus going, I got to do all 12 and drop some of the balls. Mm -hmm. And then it feels like a mess. But for you, I'd go, okay, if you're going seven days a week, what is five days a week for three months look like? Like, let's this just, is, get that is what I've been doing. I've, I've been doing five. Yeah. And for like the last five weeks and I am down 10 pounds. So, so yeah. there's that yeah, because so I know that I won't sustain a hundred percent. Ongoing. Yeah, so I think it's just flexibility. And then I think the other thing is the 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 longer you do stuff like this, the more you you give yourself resilience. I always say resilience, my definition is um the willingness to begin again when things don't go the way you want yeah. them to go. Like it's not so you have to be a Navy SEAL, it's just I get to begin again. So for you, it's okay. One week because of travel, it's only it's only two days, and the next week it's not zero. I can yeah. I can begin again. So like next week we're going to Flagstaff for a week. I know I won't do CrossFit. So like that's yeah. the other thing with flexibility is, for me to have a great marriage, I don't want to put my health rules on my wife. If I say to her, "Hey, I know we're going to Flagstaff, but I got to find a CrossFit gym four times," yes. like that's a sucky family vacation that, that really, I'm shaping yes. the family vacation around yeah. like. Yeah. So like the flexibility to go, no, like Flagstaff is not going to be a workout week. Cool. Yeah. I know that going in, I'm not going to feel shame about that. I'm not going to worry about that. Guess right. what? The week after I'm not going to try to catch up. I'm right. not going to go, Double I got to do 14. I got to do yeah. four. Like, I'm not going to binge the goal. People can binge goals. So like anything you binge eventually crashes. So like, okay, how do I do this at a pace? And so I'm learning pace the older I get. And pace is yeah. a really beautiful word that people don't like. Um, mm -hmm. Limits is another word people don't like, but man, yep. if you want to, I want to, here's the last thing I'd say on this topic. I want to run until I'm like 85. Now I could run 50 miles a week or try to do that. I could try to overdo it, but I know then at like 65, my knees would be like, knees nah, be dude, you're completely yeah. over. So I'd rather do 15 miles a week for the next 30 years than overdo it and yeah. lose that. And we've all seen people overdo it and and go, oh, I don't want to end up like that. Like, yeah. I don't know, yeah. like that's not burn where out. I want to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to burn out like that. And so for me, learning pace has been a really helpful exercise. Yeah. I love when you talk about Jenny, your wife, yeah. and um, she seems like a great um, counter to your ambitiousness. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. T tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's just, she's brilliant. First of all, she's brilliant. She has her undergrad in photojournalism and uh -huh. her master's in construction management from Georgia tech. So she went to Georgia tech with an industry that's male dominated and got a full mm -hmm. ride and was building homes Amazing. And, like massive buildings in Boston. So she's really, really smart. Um, and she has all the things I don't have. Like she doesn't yes. care if people, like what people think about her. I care that the waiter thinks I'm funny. Like yeah. we're the opposite that way. So she's right. very like, like, let's not worry about that. Um, she'll tell me the truth and I'm yes. 22 years in. I'll listen to that truth and be like, oh yeah, that's a good. She's also point. funny when you quote her on social media. I'm like, yeah. she's, you did a post the other day about waiting in line somewhere. Cause you have one way of picking like the checker, the right. cashier, and she has a yeah. completely other. I'm like, yeah. I really like his wife. She's, she's funny. really, she's really funny. And, and I like, I only share like 4% of the things she says. So for me, I'm able to bounce so many things off her and go, Hey, what do you think? What am I missing? Like, Hey, okay, here's what I want to do in 2024. What am I not seeing? And she'll go yeah. these three things. And I'll go, Oh, Ooh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, you're right. And, and she's great at sequence. Like I can't, I'm not great naturally at sequencing things uh -huh. and she can go, no, if you move these two things, these 11 other things happen. And I go, Oh, okay. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, she'll, and again, like, she'll tell me the truth about like one of the things she said to me is she'll be like, 
stop saying you have haters. You don't. She's like, you say it to be dramatic because you're an artist. You don't have hundreds of people that actively think about how much they hate you. You have like is- two grumpy people you bump into. You say hate because it sounds more narcissistic <laughs> and it makes it seem like you're oh, so man. important that you have haters. Yeah. You don't have haters. Like Trump has haters. Biden yes. has haters. Like stop it. And so she's also good at when I get dramatic or like kind of thinking artistically in a way that's exaggerated and ultimately not helpful. She'll go, "Mm, why don't we, let's, let's look at this a different angle and be like, oh yeah, you're right. right." I wonder if your wife and my husband um, are like the same person in different bodies, because I will say to Jason, um, and I know you'll probably be able to relate to this. um, Kansas city is a city, but it's also like a smallish community. So a lot of times when we go out in public, people recognize me because of my social media following or they'll recognize recognize my kids first, which is wild. And so there'll be times when we like need to go run an errand or something. I'll be like, well, hang on. Let me me change my clothes and put on some makeup. And he's like, why? I'm like, because inevitably we're going to run into somebody we know. And he'll be like, Jen, nobody is thinking about you that much. Nobody cares what you look like. This is not the Jennifer show. And and it just like, it, it kind of snaps me back into reality sometimes. Now I still change my clothes and put on makeup, but it's yeah, just yeah. good that he will remind me that I'm not quite as important or, you know, as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I am. I'm like, thank you for just bringing that down and reminding me that I'm making it all about me, even though I didn't mean to make it all about me. And yeah. so I think that's no, I, probably a lot of us. Invaluable. In it's invaluable. Yeah. It's invaluable. And, and it's so fun. I mean, the joke we do about that specific thing is if somebody recognizes me and says like, Hey, I read one of your books. I really Mm -hmm. liked it. And then it's 10 minutes and we walk away. I'll say to my wife and you get to spend all Saturday with me. Can you imagine (laughs) how amazing that person only got 10 minutes, you get the whole day. And she's like, Oh, or I'll say that to my kids and we have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's, there's something amazing um, about what Andy Stanley would call a full cup spouse, like a wife mm-hmm. who's a husband who's full cup, a wife who's full mm-hmm. cup, where um, like what they're able to challenge you on, encourage mm-hmm. you on, inspire you on, you know, uh, call you. I think that great relationships um, can call you beyond you can call yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And they can see things you can't see because you're so close to the painting yes. often that you can't tell what it is. And they're standing back a little and go, oh, here's yeah. what I see. So yeah, yeah. I we're so good. 20, 22 years in and it's only getting more fun. Yeah. Oh, well, I, we are 26 almost years in. So high five to that. Nice. Um, yes. And does just get better. So let's talk about the three types of goals you talk about in the book, yeah. because we have an audience, you know, mostly entrepreneurs. So they're going to be driven. They are goal setters. They, you know, know what they want to make in 2023 and how many sales they want to get and all the things. So I know you talk about easy, middle and guaranteed goals. Will you kind of give us, yeah. flesh that out just a little bit for us? Yeah. So I think about it like a ladder, like imagine a goal ladder and one of the vertical rails um, is effort. And one of the vertical rails is time. And so a goal ladder is you take steps up it as you go and you build a long-term sustainable goal that allows mm-hmm. you to consistently tap into your full potential. So at the very bottom are easy goals. And there's a couple of characteristics of easy goals. One would be they take one to seven days. They don't take a lot of your time. Um, the steps are obvious. People aren't impressed when they hear about them. And then middle goals take a little more time, take a, take a little more dedication. They, they impact your schedule in a different way. And then guaranteed goals take a lot of time. They have a long time frame. They could be up to a year long. And so what a lot of people do, the mistake they make is they stand at the bottom of the goal ladder and they try to jump and grab the guaranteed goal rung and go, I'm going to do this massive thing. Like I, I yes. got to go big or go home. Right. And mm-hmm. they don't know how to translate that into small steps. So if I said to you, Jennifer, okay, here's a ladder. It's 12 feet tall. You can climb it one of two ways. You can climb it each step and climb it up bit yeah. by bit by bit, or you can try to jump and touch and grab the 12 foot part and pull yourself up. Mm-hmm. Like now 12 feet is two feet taller than a basketball rim. I've never dunked. Maybe you've dunked and you're like, that's not, easy. not, not recently actually. Yeah. yeah. But most people, what we're taught in popular motivational circles is you got to have some dream that's so big, it scares you to death. And you should have a big dream. But the problem is, unless you translate it into easy goals, you can actually do that turn into middle goals Mm -hmm. and then turn into guaranteed goals. It's really, really challenging. And and so one for me is I never write a book. I write a hundred words. I never write a book. I write a thousand words. I write like right now. My, you know, the goal I'm working on is to do 5,000 words on a new book that's due in September, 5,000 words. And I'm going to take probably two weeks ish to work on that. 
Like, but I'm not saying you got to write this book. That's a guaranteed goal. I guarantee that book will be done because I will have taken all these steps by the end, by the, by September, mm -hmm. like that's happening. And so that's what I mean by three different types of goals. But a lot of people again, go, I want to go big or go home. And they get stuck trying to do this massive thing and never yes. break it down to small ways to go, okay, here's an easy goal that I'm going to try. And then let's, you mentioned marriage. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier, like an easy goal. One of the characteristics is it's not expensive. If you make your goal expensive out of the gate, you just gave that stuck self, that portion of you that doesn't want to change, a fantastic excuse not to change. If you go, I want to lose weight, but I got to go to this gym to do it. And the gym's expensive, can't do it. Yes. You've already prevented your progress. So an okay. easy goal is not expensive. It doesn't cost a lot of money for you to take a couple steps. Mm -hmm. And it also allows your spouse to get on board. Like if, a, if you go to your spouse and go, hey, I want to do this business. I only need $10,000. They should rightfully so go, can you show me the other steps you've done before you needed? Yep. Amen. Mm -hmm. And if you can't show the steps, like it's hard for a spouse to support wishes. It's way easier for them to support yeah. actions. And if yeah. you go, here's the 10 act, like I've been taking these easy goals. I grew them the middle goals. Now it's time to invest. The first blog I ever had that was kind of what launched me I built it myself. It was on Blogspot. It had a typo in the URL. I was on Blogspot was at one time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so once it, like two years in, I paid a designer three grand to build it. But if yeah. I had said to my wife when we had zero dollars, like we right. were, Saturday night was us going to Chick-fil-A and splitting a kid's meal and hoping the kids didn't finish theirs because it was like, maybe they'll leave some waffle fries for us. Got it. Like maybe yes. If I had said to her, Hey, I need three grand to build this website. I haven't done much on it, but I would like, right. three grand. She'd yeah. Be like, uh, yeah, that's not how this works. Two years in when I've done yeah. easy goals and middle goals and I'm working and I go, Hey, I think it's time for us to invest in this. She's like, <laughs> let's go. And so that's the process. So you climb the ladder and you do it deliberately. I love that. Tell me when all it takes is a goal comes out September. Is that right? Comes out in September. Yeah. September, uh, second week of September. So, okay. So if somebody wants to pre-order it now, it's on Amazon, correct? It's on Amazon. That's super okay. easy. You can pre-order on Amazon. Um, and then atgbook.com. So there's a bunch of bonuses. There's posters. Okay. There's actually the coolest is if you pre-order it, you get the entire audiobook for free, which I okay. love. Um, I read the audiobook. There's 10 bonus stories in it. Um, super, super fun. But yeah, atgbook.com. Okay. Um, did you read your audiobook in Nashville? Just out of curiosity? Yeah, I did. I read it at like a super, I didn't know it was super famous, but like all my musician friends are like, you're at Blackbird Studios, what? So apparently it's a very, I'm not very cool, yeah. but the studio. Well, I did my audiobook for Fear's Not the Boss of You in Nashville also. Oh, nice. And um, and I don't remember what the name of the studio was, but all I know is that the guy had um, like Kid Rock, um, you know, oh, he yeah. has pictures of him on the wall, but he had had some famous rappers in like the week before that. So I got so much street cred with my kids, with my teenage <laughs> boys at the time. Funny. I was like that's sending funny. them pictures and, you know, all of a sudden mom's really cool. So John, this was awesome. Thank you so much. We're yeah, going to have people who want to connect with you on social media. So is Instagram your favorite? Facebook, your yeah, favorite? I would say Instagram, Instagram or Facebook. I'm, I'm just okay. John Acuff on, on Instagram. That's, that's super easy. J O N A C U F F. Um, and then I have a podcast called all it takes is a goal where I interview yes. people about the goals they're working on. So yeah, both those places are fun. I love that. Thank you so much. Thanks.